now i saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea then i john saw the holy city new jerusalem coming down out of heaven from god prepared as a bride for her husband adorned for her husband and i heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death or nor sorrow, nor shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. <clears throat> Our opening song is number 448. Please stand and join in singing hymn 448. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this time that you've cut out of this week, that we can come and we can worship you. Lord, help us to set aside the week that's just happened and just focus on the here and now and what you have in store for us. Open our hearts and our minds to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
our offering this morning is for a church budget. And the church budget provides funds for all the church's ministries. So it's a very important offering. All the church's ministries draw from the Sabbath school, Pathfinders, evangelism, and pays for the heat and light for this sanctuary. So this is an important offering. So the deacons will wait upon us now for our offering. <laughs>
Gracious Father in heaven, we thank thee for all thy blessings. We thank thee for the opportunity to return our tithes and offerings, and we pray thy blessing upon these funds. that They will go to help win more souls to, to the kingdom of heaven. Bless our church and its ministries. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now it's time for the children's story, so we invite the kids to come up to the front, and Vicki should have a story for you. And collect an offering as you come. Okay, so we've been talking about families, and today I'm going to tell you about another family. It was a mom and dad and four children, and the dad passed away. But by the time that happened, the boys were pretty much big enough to help run their farm. Now, this is a long time ago, okay? So the mom, her name was Teresa. She had three boys, Matthew, Joseph, and Terry, and she had a daughter, Martha. And they worked a few years, and the kids were just kind of feeling like, boy, there must be more to life than just working on this farm. Oh, they were, they were okay. They, they liked their neighbors, and they loved their Christian family, and but they just felt like there was something more. So Matthew decided he was going to see. He was going to get on a ship, and he was going to go to see and see all kinds of great new places, and it was going to be grand. And Martha had seen a circus, and she loved the animals, and she felt like after working with the animals on the farm, she should be pretty good with them. So when the circus came back, she joined the circus to try to be an animal trailer. Now, then Joseph heard there was a railroad going in out west, and that sounded good to him. You don't see what the railroad's all about. He'd seen a train once. That was pretty neat. So they're all gone. The only one home is Terry, and Terry's only 12. And it's hard. He and Mom are working like anything, trying to keep the farm going. But it's a big farm. They grew corn and wheat. They raised pigs to sell. That's how they made their living. And it was just really a struggle. And then one day, Mom got sick. Now, Mom was a Christian woman. Every day she prayed, and Terry prayed with her. 
and but things just didn't go well and one of the neighbors came over and said you know I really think you should get a hold of your brothers and sisters I think they should be here I think your mom needs help so he sent out letters but you know when you're out at sea when you're traveling with the circus and you're working on the railroad it takes a while for letters to get there but eventually they all three came back home but it was too late mom was gone but terry said you know she prayed for you guys every single day that you'd be safe and that you wouldn't forget what you were taught about the lord and that you would come back well they kind of hung out for a little while and then they realized you know, they really did miss their Christian family. And they really did miss the farm. <sighs> Matthew said, well, you know, C was not what he thought it was going to be. He thought it was going to be an adventure, but it was just nothing but backbreak and work and storms and seasickness and boy. And when Martha went with the circus, they were okay to her, but a lot of people did not, and especially back then, did not like the idea of a woman traveling with the circus. That just was not proper. And she kind of took some grief for that. Plus, because she was new, her job wasn't really to train the animals. Her job was just to clean cages and feed the animals and all the work. Joseph was okay. He liked working on the railroad. But he was informed when he got the letter that, you know what, we're only going to be going a few more months and the railroad will be connected to another railroad coming from the other direction. And your job is pretty much done. Well, Terry was still praying. His mom told him, you don't give up. You keep praying for your brothers and sister." They went to church with him, and while they were sitting in church with him, it just really occurred to them, they, they really need to stay home. Terry couldn't run that farm alone, and it really was a good farm. Terry said, I knew it, because Mom was praying. Prayers are always heard. No matter that it takes a long time, we may not even see when we pray how the Lord works. But prayer always works. Shall we pray? Go ahead, Daniel. I got a turn from today, so I'm going that way. I had to go to a church. Amen. Dear Father, thank you that we can know our prayers will always come to you, and they will always be heard. In Jesus' name. Time now for our congregational prayer. There were two slips handed in. This one was submitted by Susie. It is praise from Mara Vision. Praise God that Mara Vision and Adventist World Radio are working together to establish six radio stations all across Kenya. Prayers to get quick approval from the church division and union leadership. Prayers to acquire the licensing for the radio station. Mara Vision needs one million people praying. So this is Susie's request for us so we can pray today for Mara Vision and Adventist World Radio to establish these new radio stations to spread the light. This is handed in by James Earl. My sister Jennifer has been pretty sick for the last seven days. 
And I told her that I'll ask the church to pray for healing, and she was thrilled for that. So I'm wondering if any of you have a special concern you'd like to reach out to God for as we seek God in prayer. Would you raise your hand? Many hands, yes, many of us have concerns. As far as it's convenient, shall we kneel as we seek God in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we come before thee in prayer this morning, grateful for your love and your salvation. I pray that you will bless us today, bless Matt as he brings us the message, bless our hearts to be open to the light that you have brought us here to receive. May we sense your presence here in this congregation as we come to worship before thee. And I pray that you will bless Jennifer, James's sister. She's been sick, and she needs your healing. So we pray that you will lay your hand of healing upon her. May she quickly recover, and may she sense your presence and your blessing. So, and you saw the many hands that were raised, many other concerns that are represented here this morning. Bless each concern as the, each one has reached out to you for, for your help. May your blessing be seen and, and the blessing benefit those that were concerned. Bless us now as we continue our worship this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Our special music this morning is going to be brought to us by the children's division. So as the kids and the leaders start making their way forward, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do down um, stairs on Sabbath morning. So we begin singing around 925 and sing for about 20 minutes with exuberance and enthusiasm most Sabbath mornings. Um, so today they're going to share a song with you called If I Were a Butterfly.
Thank you, kids, for that beautiful song. Our scripture reading is Revelation 14, verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. Well, look at there, 50%. I want to give you guys a thank you for praying for the Frayne family. We've been through a lot in the last couple of weeks. Um, currently, right now, my father-in-law has gotten off the vent this last week down in Kalamazoo. Now they've gone through rehab, and um, they booted him out of the one rehab. They moved him because he got off the vent, and he now is in a short-term pseudo-rehab with Mary Freebed in Kalamazoo. Um, and when, they came, when he came in, he was, came in in a wheelchair, and next thing you know, he was, up, he, was up, he was up walking around, which the nurses were not all that excited about. He's walking down the hallway with a fall risk. But he's not a fall risk. Uh, more than likely, they're bringing him home on Monday. So we've been traversing through COVID, uh, pneumonia, and everything with my father-in-law. Um, and so I want to thank the church family for keeping him in prayers. My mom is holding... Uh, her own right now, um, and so continue to keep her in prayers for comfort. I had an interesting phone call last night. As some of you may know, Elizabeth and Scott are in Africa in Zambia, and she's like, she calls me up. And it's like 10 o'clock at night, their time, and she's like, Dad, you wouldn't believe what just happened. I'm like, what has happened? That called me at 10 o'clock your time, and it was 4 o'clock in the afternoon our time. She's like, we're all having worship, and we heard something rustling around in the woods. Well, what they're doing is they went away camping for the weekend down near the Zambezi, and they're right outside of a national refuge area. And so we were just sitting around having worship, and we heard something in the woods, and so, or in the bush or whatever, and so they took, and the Craig Hardy, and took his big flashlight and put it, and it was a mama and a dada and a baby elephant. <laughs> Not really cute, <laughs> because the tent, one of the tents was set up under the tree that they like to eat from, and the tent was not all that successful. Fortunately, nobody was in that tent, and so they all got up and ran and went to a shelter or something like that, and then the elephants. I didn't hear from them yet today, so I don't know how that all shook out through their night, but I couldn't imagine trying to still sleep when you know that there's something that's thousands of pounds roaming around your site. So they're having an extremely amazing time, and the Lord is really blessing them. But now we're going to get into part two of two. So I'm sorry if you missed last week's. We set a bunch of groundwork. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time in Daniel last week. And uh, this week we're going to touch on Daniel and go to the book of Revelation. Join me as we have prayer real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this time that you've given us that we can come and lift you up. And Lord, as we open your word, help it to be clear and precise to us. Open our hearts and our minds to you talking. And Lord, if there's anything between us and you, put your finger on that and point it out. Because there's nothing more than we want to be one with you and to follow you where you lead us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The mark or a seal. So last week we talked about the characteristics of Satan. We found out that he is a murderer, he's a deceiver. He's a thief, a tempter, and a distorter. Do we all agree with that? Have we all seen what Satan has done to our world, to our lives, to our society? I mean, just now in our church family right now, there are many that are struggling with some health concerns. 
This is not the work of our loving Heavenly Savior. This is the work of sin and the deceiver. He wants nothing more than to take you to destruction. And he has set up a whole plan and a whole system in which the Bible actually says that would be so convincing that it, should, it shouldn't surprise us, that it should even deceive, if possible, the very elect. What that means is those that have started to know this, the Bible, and are at one with Christ, it is going to be so powerful and so deceiving in the end time that it will be, if possible, a deception for the ones that know the most. He wants... Worship and service. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4. He who oppresses, we're talking about Satan here, who oppresses and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So there's no secrets here on what Satan wants to do. What does he want to do? He wants to be God. He wants it. He wants worship. He wants adoration. He wants people to knowingly and unknowingly follow him. Last week, we talked about, we touched on some definitions. The beasts. When you study prophecy, the beasts are kingdoms. Waters are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. A wind is strife or warfare. And we, if you were reading, or you were this last week, we talked in Daniel 7. We talked about these beasts. We talked about the beasts from the seas. The beasts amongst where all the people are. We have a lion with wings, which represents Babylon. We have a bear raised up on one side with three ribs in his mouth. That's the Medes and the Persians. We have another beast, a leopard with four heads. That's Greece. Then we have a monster with iron teeth with ten horns. And this was the Roman Empire. This is all history. There's nothing secret about this. This prophecy is very self explanatory The Bible pretty much tells you who it is later on in the chapter. Then we had a little horn that would come up amongst the ten nations of Rome, the divided Rome have a man as his head, and it would speak for it. It would pluck up three kingdoms. It was different from the other kingdoms. It would make war and persecute the saints. It was emerged from the Roman Empire. God's people will be given to it for a times, times, and half a time. It would speak great words against, or would blaspheme God, and it would intend to change times and laws. This is in review of everything that we went through last week. Now, this week, we go to new territory. So the beautiful thing about prophecy is that it always starts here, you learn that concept, and then it goes to the next concept. So it reviews, and then it builds. It reviews, and it builds. So today, we're going to build on this So turn in your Bibles with me to Revelation 13. Revelation 13, verse 1. Where are they? Then I, John, stood on the sand of the sea and saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads, on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw were like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. Does this verbiage sound familiar? The dragon, 
gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and a deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped this beast, saying, Who is like this beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and, to, and the authority was given to him over every tribe, nation, and tongue. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names are not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads in in into ca captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with a sword must be killed with a sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So right now, we have this beast that it's talking about, that John sees. And this beast comes from where? It rises from the sea. What is the sea? Peoples, nations, and tongues, right? It rises from a place of population. Do me a favor. Here's in contrast. Go to verse 11 real quick. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. I'm not going to Bible study today, but this is, a, if we're thinking the earth, you have the sea and you have the opposite of the sea, the earth, Probably a place of desolation, a place where there aren't a lot of people. Totally different Bible study. If you guys want me to preach on that again, I will. But just a note, you're seeing a contrast here. Prophecy builds and grows, starts over, builds and grows. So this one rises out of the sea. It is a composite of the four beasts in Daniel. In Daniel. Did you guys pick up on that? It talks about a leopard a bear, and a lion. Now, this is John talking about this, right? So in what order does John talk about these beasts? It's in reverse order. Why is it in reverse order? John was living in the time of Rome. He was living in the time of the great monster. So he's saying, hey, I'm in the time of the monster. Now let's go back. Leopard, bear, lion. Daniel talks about it, and Daniel starts in the prophecy and has lived through the time of the lion. Towards the end of his life, he steps into the life of the bear, and then after that, he has the leopard and the great monster. So interesting to see the perspectives. But just that perspective there tells me that they're connected. It's a point. The dragon. Who is the dragon? Satan. He's an amazing puppeteer. And unfortunately, I have been used by him. I'm not going to talk about you saints, but myself. The dragon gives it its power. This dragon receives a deadly wound. This dragon receives a deadly wound. We talked about that last week. At the end of the 1260 days, what happened at the end of the 1260 days? 1798, I believe. Berthier went and took the Pope right off of his own throne. Took him up and he died in exile. At that point in time, the press read a brutal wound. It's dead. It's gone. But this beast revives, and its deadly wound is healed. Now, in verse 3 and 7, it is a strong and deadly power. This beast is a strong and deadly power. Did we talk about last week about a strong and deadly power also? Yes, we did. It's a strong religious power. Did we talk about a religio-political power last week also? And it's guilty of blasphemy. What is blasphemy? 
Having the ability, saying you have the ability to forgive sins, this is a biblical definition, right? Saying you have the ability to forgive sins in saying that you're God. Those are the two definitions of blasphemy. So this beast in Revelation is sounding a lot like the same beast in Daniel 7. It wars and overcomes the saints. And it rules for 42 months. Do you know how many times this time period is to mentioned in Scripture? Were all of you guys sleeping last week? How many times? Seven times. And it's described two different ways. Times, times, and half a time. And it's described as 42 months. It's the same time parameter. I don't have time. I'm giving you guys like a 10,000 foot view here. If you have any questions that come up from last week's presentation to this week's presentation, please come and talk to me and let's do a Bible study on it. If I don't have time, I will hook you up and link you up with somebody that has the time to give you the Bible study. Because this is powerful, powerful stuff. And we are encouraged as Adventists to know this stuff inside and out. This is the devil's playbook, and we have it. And then in verse 18, which we didn't read, it has a mysterious number of 666. I want to talk a little bit about that number. If you actually read that, if you go to verse 18 for me. So 13, verse 18. He says, Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for is it the number of a man, and his number is 666. It says his number is of a man. Not the Antichrist number is 66. This is just a number of his name. It's a whole other study on how to calculate what that is through the Roman numerals and things like that. But there's a whole study on that, and it really points right exactly to the same power that we are talking about. So if you get the 666 written on your hand or whatever, it is not, it is not the mark of the beast. 666 is not the mark of the beast. I'm telling you that right now. It's the number of the name of the man. Am I clear on that? So going through all these points, going through all these points, everything that we've talked about, we know who this power is. We know who this entity is. This entity has been around for a very long time. One of the things that the Antichrist wants, and this is a theme that we have through the whole book of Revelation, is worship. The whole theme of what we're studying is worship. You read verse 8, All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life, and causes as many as would not worship the image of the beast be killed. There are 24 references in Revelation for the word worship. The Antichrist wants to be like Christ. I just gave you the Bible verse. He sets himself up on high. He sets himself above the clouds. He wants worship. It's no secret. So why would this anti why would a mark be anything different but worship related? I had to look up what worship meant. Merriam-Webster says, to honor or show reverence for a, for a divine being or supernatural power. Worship is a central theme to this great controversy. Revelation 14, we're going to read this one more time. 6 and 7 says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tongue, tribe, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Verse 9, Then the third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on their forehead 
or on their hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Isaiah 14 says, For, I have said in, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation of the furthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. It's no secret, guys. This guy wants worship. And it all boils down to who are we going to worship? Would it surprise us that he wants worship through a false religion? But mind you, I want to tell you this right now. Satan always has 99 or 95% truth tied to whatever he does. If you look at the account of Adam and Eve, with Eve is talking with Satan in the tree, he reads back to her, most of it's true. Twists it a little bit, but most of it, you can make an argument, is true. His tactic has not changed. But I want to talk about this entity. This entity here, and we talked about it last week, but I want to go in a little bit more in depth. This entity seems to change times and laws. So I brought with me, I brought with me a book. I've talked in the past, often on Daniel and Revelation, I says, you know what, I actually need to get the book that this stuff is quoted from, because I need to see it and feel it with my own hands. So I went, about eight or seven, seven or eight years ago, I went and bought the Catholic Catechism book. This is, the, this is printed in 2010, this version of it was printed in 2010, and I'm like, I need this for my own self. I don't want to, you know, Doug Batts or whoever says, this is what it says. No, I want it in my hand. I have it in my hand. Some fascinating reading. So, in this portion of the center part of this, it talks about um, in, in life of Christ section, life in Christ section in this in the Catechism. Go to where it says it thinks to change times and laws. I'm like, could somebody really even change the law of God? Is that even possible? You shall not make for yourselves any carved images. Right here, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. This is the first commandment, right? We all agree with this, right? The name of your Lord is holy. This is right out of the book here. This is right out, if you want to go to the commandments of God, this is right out of their catechism. The second commandment, the name of the Lord is holy. The third commandment, the Sabbath day. It talks extensively about the Sabbath day. Fourth commandment, honor your father and mother. You shall not kill. The fifth, you shall not commit adultery. The sixth, you shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not cover your neighbor's house. And it talks about carnal lusts. You should not cover your neighbor's house again. And but it talks about as car, as as um, coveting your neighbor's assets. What commandment is missing? Idol worship. Come on. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness that is in thereof, that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath. For For that is in the water underneath the earth. You shall not bow down nor serve them. For I, the Lord, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the Father upon the children of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. This book wasn't from the 1800s, wasn't from the 1500s. This was 2010. That is the Ten Commandments that is in this book, and it's missing the second one. Why? Why? Because it has the authority to do it. He thinks to change times and laws. What does the book say on the Sabbath day? 
I have it flagged here, so I don't have to look too hard for it. So in the life in Christ, when it talks extensively about the Sabbath day, it says, Sunday is expressly distinguished from the Sabbath, which it follows chronologically every week. For Christians, its ceremonial observer, observance replaces that of the Sabbath. In Christ's Passover, Sunday fulfills the spiritual truth of the Jewish Sabbath and announces man's eternal rest in God. For worship under the law prepared for the mystery of Christ, and that was done there prefigured some aspects of Christ. The celebration of Sunday observes a moral commandment inscribed by nature in the human heart to render to God an outward, visible, public, and regular worship as a sign of universal benefits to, beneficence to all. Sun, listen to this. Sunday worship fulfills the moral command of the Old Covenant, taking up its rhythm and spirit in the weekly celebration of the Creator and Redeemer of His people. It's right out of their book. We have the authority to change it. What else did they change in relationship to the Sabbath? I'm going to ask you guys this. What else did they change? They changed the day from Saturday to Sunday what else has been changed on the Sabbath? Which we keep six out of seven days. The days start and end. As Adventists, Friday night rolls around, we prepare for that Friday night at sundown. We forward to that Friday night at sundown as entering the Sabbath. Where did the midnight to midnight come from? Rome. Rome. It's been around a long time. But Rome changed it as the day starts at midnight and ends at midnight. Biblical standard is the day starts at sundown and ends at sundown. So adopted in Roman, Roman time, so I had to ask Miriam again, what is Sabbath? The Sabbath day, the seventh day of the week, observed from Friday evening to Saturday evening as a day of rest and worship by Jews and some Christians. Don't you find that interesting that Miriam Webster nailed, you, nailed it when the day starts and ends even in their definition of Sabbath? Not only keeping the seventh day of the week, it says it starts at Friday night and ends at Saturday night. Sunday, then it has Sunday, observed among Christians as a day of rest and worship. I want to hit this again. The characteristics of Satan. He's a murderer, a deceiver, a thief, a tempter, and a distorter. Last camp meeting. For years, I can't tell you how long I've been going to camp meeting. There is one presenter, I take his class every year. I think he was 91 years old, and he actually passed away at camp meeting, R.A. Holmes, Dr. Holmes. You know, the beautiful thing is, I don't know if you guys know, but when I was a kid, he was the minister of the Grand Haven Seventh-day Adventist Church. For a moment, remember that, Stacy? For a moment, he was here. I would go to his class, and just sit at the feet of a master. So I was doing some research, trying to come up with some concepts that I was just trying to really flesh out. And I, I did a Google search, and like the second thing that came up was this paper that he had written to uh, the theo theology uh, department at Andrews about worship and about the, the purpose of worship. And it was just, it's some powerful stuff. But I want to quote some of it. It is hard, this is R.A. Holmes talking, Dr. Holmes. It is hard to imagine a more critical and decisive situation than that described in chapter 13. You have to understand, he's talking about worship, which sets the scene of an equally crucial and dramatic event described in chapter 14, a blasphemous religion, religious system, united with influential political power in the guise of true religion is preaching a false gospel that wins people throughout the world to worship a false god. Furthermore, coercive ministry, because death 
is the consequence for refusing to worship the false god. He goes on, no greater travesty of the Christian religion could be conceived. It is so contradictory to the nature of God, so inhumane and out of harmony with the biblical message of atonement that it could have only been conceived and executed by by only Satan, who leads the whole world astray. Last of all, is the realization that this devilish evangelism, which will be supported and fostered by those who should be on the side of the true God, alongside the true church, preaching the true gospel and winning people to worship the true God. Powerful, powerful statement. Last week I talked about a book, and I actually opened up and read a couple things from it. i got to get it in my bag. I brought some extras with me. I'm not going to go into it, to the, to the article, but if you guys do not have this book right here, this pamphlet here, it's called Rome's Challenge. It is not written by an Adventist. It's actually written by a Catholic bishop in defense of the Sabbath. There is nobody I know, and my world's pretty small in the theological world, but that could write a better narrative on the Sabbath than this. So if you do not have one, they're right here. Get it, put it in your library, use it. It's powerful stuff, but you remember the one, I, I gotta read that one little note. The one little note. It says, <clears throat> Before closing this series of articles, so towards the end, he's talking about, we beg to call the attention of our readers once more to the caption introductory of, of each. The Christian Sabbath, the genuine offspring of the union of the Holy Spirit and the Catholic Church, his spouse. So where is the Christian Sabbath? Where did it come from? From the Holy Spirit and the Catholic Church. He says it right here. And then he says, in the second point of here, the claim of Protestants to any part therein proved to be groundless, self-contradictory, and suicidal. He uses the word suicidal. Very similar to what Dr. Holmes used. But I want to encourage each one of you guys. Not everybody has the truth that you guys have been given. I praise the Lord, and I wish that each one of you understand how important it is to follow God in all that you do. I will tell you this right now. This truth that I'm talking about right now does not save you. Knowing who the beast is, knowing who the, what the seal of God is, keeping the Sabbath to the best of your ability, this does not save you. I want you to understand your relationship with Jesus Christ is what saves you. And if that relationship with Jesus Christ is fully submitted to him in all that he's asked you to do and all that he's asked you to be, you would follow in his footsteps and you would do what he's asked you to do out of obedience. This information right here is good information that gives us hope and understanding that he is in full control. Like I said, he's given us the playbook of nothing to be scared of, nothing to, be, nothing to fear. We know what's going to happen. There's going to be some tough times. There's going to be some really tough times. One of the toughest times I've had in the last handful of years when Al Lawson passed away. There was no real reason for that guy to pass away. And when he passed away, I was like, why, Lord? He was so on fire for you. He was just 40-some-odd years old. Why? Then I read a quote from Ellen White, and she says, in the last days, those that are saved, sometimes he's just going to lay some of them to rest. His understanding of death is totally different than what we understand. He just lays them to rest and says, you know what, you're going to take this next minute off because your salvation is sure in me right now. I find power in that. So what is this mark of the beast? I want you to say that, it, I want to tell you, it's not an actual chip. It's not. This is the example I use. All right. You're going to go chip some cannibal pygmy in the middle of... <laughs> You're going to go put a chip in them, right? Because you have to understand, when Christ returns, at the end of time, there are only two classes of people. Those with the mark of the beast and those with the seal of God. That's it. There is no way it can be a physical mark. Now, I'm not saying that there won't be some physical marks. People are going to try to do what they're going to try to do. But when it really boils down to it... Uh, through COVID, right? So I'm still dealing with it, obviously, with my own family. 
I'm not taking the vaccine because in it has a small chip. Did we hear any of that? And you know what I tell them? You have yeah, there is one in there. You better watch out. You gotta bait it a little bit. It's not a physical mark or a chip. The whole world wanders. The whole world wanders after this beast. It blows my mind. The whole world wanders after him. It is a worship centered in the authority of Satan through a blasphemous religion, through a blasphemous religious system. Now we have to ask ourselves, why is this mark of the beast in the forehead and in the hand? I want to tell you guys, I am still only just touching this stuff because my time is running out. But in the mind is where we make all of our decisions. The, in the forehead is where our decisions are made. And if it were in the back of our head, let's say, let's say it was in the back of our head where it's more of the, the habitual stuff, right? Then there's no thought, and there's no thought that each one of you are breathing right now. But I tell you what, there had to be a thought in the head saying, hey, you know what, I know Matt's preaching today, but I'm going to go to church regardless. You had to make that decision this morning in the front of your head. You had to. Some of you have had to make the decision, you know what, I no longer am going to church on Sunday, I'm going to go to church on Sabbath. Some have had to make that decision. Some of us have had to make the decision, you know what, this whole state of the dead thing, I believe so-and-so was always in heaven, but I have to believe what the Bible says, even though it's hard, because that's what I've been taught. You have to make a conscious decision. So it's the mark of the beast is in the head. We've made a personal decision to either follow the beast voluntarily, and it's in the hand, because maybe I can work for it. Also, maybe it's in the hand because I really don't care about religion. That is becoming a bigger and bigger thing. There are so many unchurched people. If you look at national standards right now for church, I mean, we went through 9-11 and everyone was going to church. How long ago was that? 11 years ago. And now no one's going to church. In 11 years. Were that finicky? There's a whole study on that, and I don't want to spend all of our time on that, but I'll tell you this right now. The mark of the beast is a decision that is made in each one of our heads on whom we are going to serve and when we're going to serve them. My favorite part of this message, what then is the seal of God? I could care less what the mark of the beast is. I got the whole world, my rest of my eternity, waiting on, do I know what the seal of God is? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all the work, but the seventh is the Sabbath day of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, nor do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all in them and rested the Sabbath day. The seventh day, sorry. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Right here, God gives us the authority of why and who and what he does. His seal is in this day. And he blesses and he hallows it. And he says, you know what? I have made this day for you to enjoy. Go and enjoy it. To hallow is to make holy, to consecrate, to be greatly revered and to be honored. I also gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me, them and me, that they might know that I, the Lord, who sanctifies them. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel, how long? Forever, that in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. Hallow my Sabbath, that there will be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord, your God. Hebrews 10, 16 says, this is the covenant that I made with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them in their minds. I want you to tell you this. God wants the best. 
He wants the best for you. When you go to heaven, when you go to heaven, and he lays out this person, this person here shared Christ and was a minister to the gospel to, to his own little marn, talk about myself. Everything that he did was Christ-like. All of this stuff is about me. And if I can't look at that and say, Lord, I was just following in your steps. Thank you for giving me these opportunities. Thank you for make, giving me the ability to surrender my heart to you and to walk hand in hand with you through this life. Or are we on the other side where he gives you the same thing. He ministered to those around him. He did all of this stuff. And you look at him, he's like, Lord, I don't know who that is. He's like, yeah, I know, but that's who I intended you to be. We have a decision to make. I'm telling you right now, if you want a full life, follow Jesus where he asks you to go. Follow him where he asks you to go. Your life will be a blessing to others, but it will be a storybook. I'm not saying it's going to be all highs, but there's definitely going to be some lows, but I will tell you this, your fingerprint, the fingerprints of God will be all over it. That you will be able to, when you get to those gates, he will say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. The seal of God is his Sabbath. The seal of God is his Sabbath. The musicians can start coming up right now as we wrap this up. It says, do not harm the earth, the sea, and the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. Have we really gone to try to seek the face of Jesus? Brothers and sisters, do we know what his face looks like? Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on the Mount Zion. And with him, 144,000 having the Father's name written on their forehead. The seal of God was on their forehead, and they were not destroyed. And they were following the lamb. They were following Jesus, wherever he asked them to go. As we get ready to sing our closing song, these are the redeemed. This is you and I, right? We consider ourselves redeemed, right? These are the redeemed. There are only two classes at this time, each of them with a mark. Whose mark will you have?
Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for taking us through this Bible study, maybe giving us a little deeper understanding of what your plan is, and your plan is to meet us in the clouds of glory in that you have redeemed us. Lord, hell was not made for us. The Bible says that hell was made for the devil and his angels, and that's it, period. But Lord, you have worked in each one of our hearts. And I pray that each one of us here opens our hearts and makes the decisions to let you in. Not just this one time, but on a day-to-day -day basis, an hourly hour basis, saying, Lord, you are the king of my life. And that we go forward from here sharing the love that you have given us to others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.